So this is lecture 35 of ECE 5312. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take another tangent, but still related to this theme of performing digital communications. Um, and this time, what we're going to do is, instead of dealing with spread spectrum communication systems and jammers and wideband interference and such, we're going to take a different tact. Okay? So what were the type of negative environments, like, you know, sort of impaired environments, challenging environments, that we perform digital communications across? So we looked at AWGN, right? We looked at the very simple case where we had no other type of distortion except the randomness of noise itself. We then looked at band-limited channels. We looked at when we just simply have a channel that introduces some sort of distortion that sort of smears my information across because we just don't have enough bandwidth. It has some sort of shaping to it and such. What we're going to do now, and it's kind of related to the second item, but there's a specific name behind it. It's something called a fading channel. Okay? So what we're going to do in this lecture is we're going to go through the process of describing what is a fading channel. We're going to start with the physics first, and then we're going to proceed to model it mathematically, and then finally what we're going to do is we're going to talk about some of the statistical characteristics that we use to describe a fading channel. So at the end of this lecture, what we're going to do is essentially, from end to end, look at the physics, talk about the mathematical model, how we're going to statistically characterize it. Then the beginning of the next lecture, we're going to look at something called frequency selective fading channels. And, and in particular, we're going to dig a little deeper, and we're going to look at one type called Nakagami M. Before that, um, in this lecture, we're going to talk a little bit about Ricean and Rayleigh fading channels. So you two guys are going to be familiar with that. Um, probably, we're, it's only going to be an, at an elementary level, but uh, it gives you perspective that there are these things called Ricean and Rayleigh fading channels. And then you can impress your friends on Friday night. Like, you get together, you pr play a little bit of so what's, what's the in video game nowadays? Anyone? So not Halo, right? Because that's like so 2004. Um, any thoughts? World of Warcraft? Depends who you are. Oh, God. OK. So you play your video game of choice, and then let's say in an intermission, or you're communicating with your team as you're playing the video game, you can say, hey, did you know there's a thing called Rising and Fading? And then all of a sudden, your team gets ambushed and killed. But anyways, OK. So what happens is we saw this model here, right? So that's our additive white Gaussian noise channel. So we have signal. We add noise. In the worst possible case, it interferes greatly. And we're unable to discern what signal has actually been transmitted at the receiver. Makes it nice and ambiguous. I love it. Now let's look at the other model. And so here's a graphical representation. I'm going to, of course, draw to give a little bit more sort of the physical concept. But essentially what happens here is this here is an example of you have scatter. You have essentially, let's say this is a nice room in a building, right? So there's nice solid walls. I'm, what I'm not going to describe too much about is are these walls made of sheetrock? Are they made of aluminum? Are they glass? Are they wood? Are they concrete? Are they leaded? Are they copper? Are they made of this material here? Oh, yeah, and people don't really talk about reflections across ceilings and floors, too, right? Does the floor have some sort of metallic underbase that when they poured, do they, you know, like, you know, for instance, like, you know, when I did my sabbatical, right? It's like, salary communications is pretty tough in here. I wonder how they poured the floors. Everything's a Faraday cage, right? So, what happens is, do you have line of sight with that transmitter? Are there objects around you that cause a scatter? Right? So what happens is, how does this translate? So suppose you have your transmitted signal. So let's say at T0, bzz, I send a signal. At T1, a T0 plus alpha, so alpha seconds later, bzz, I send the next batch of information wirelessly. And then at T equals T naught plus beta. So beta seconds after the first pulse is sent. Bzz, I send more data, right? How, how is each one of those pulses picked up at the receiver? All these copies around, right? So T1, T1 plus T, tau 11 
T1 plus tau 1, 2. I have all these like darn copies of the things with different amplitude levels. Here's another case, and even more dispersive. Here's another case, even more dispersive. Let's look, let's look at this more, 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 in more detail. That and also I want a reason to draw. So remember, there was the paper by Saleh and Valenzuela. Okay? And they introduced an indoor channel model. Now, here's the problem with an indoor channel model. So I'm not sure how many of you are doing research or working on indoor wireless environments. So I think you guys are, right, for your projects. The problem, the problem about indoor channel models is that they're uniquely fingerprinted to the exact environment that you're in, right? I would wish, I would kill for a room just like this in my home. Oh yeah, I can imagine it would be in my basement, well, except for the windows. I, like, I do like the windows. And it's like stadium style seating. I would have two ginormous screens on either side. And then imagine Super Bowl. Oh, it would be wonderful. But I don't have this environment at my home, right? My basement, it's just like multiple little rooms and stuff, sheet rock. And the studs, they're two by four wood. I bet you the studs used in the walls here are all probably metallic, right? So it's going to dictate the reflective property a little bit differently than what I would have in my basement right now, right? And my, and my living room, as some of you who have uh, you know came over to my house for whatever sort of function that I'm holding and stuff, is like a shotgun, right? It's long and narrow. So signals, like where's my Wi-Fi router? It's at one end. And you can hear it clearly in my, the living room area. Why? Because the environment acts kind of like a waveguide. All that energy is channeled straight down my shotgun first floor. My second floor, it's a little bit more compact and many different bedrooms and stuff. So, and that's one environment. This, much more open, but you also have humongous windows. So what does that mean? If you have a wireless transmitter here, it probably will have a little less difficulty propagating outside than say if you had you know, gyp rock or aluminum or whatever sort of material that you're using to design that building with, right? So in this case, what Soleil and Valenzuela came up with is not exactly an exact model, but based on the physical princ principles of, of let's, say, let's say, how a signal propagates through a building inside, you can choose kind of like these fudge factor parameters and say, I think alpha should be about that. Good enough. Lambda should be about that. It's essentially like what kind of fits the environment. So what, what were the parameters that Soleil and Valenzuela looked at in this? So what they looked at were things like, first of all, wow, this thing is not changing color. What happens is this um, essentially what they looked at is inter-arrival times and intra-arrival times. And you might say, what the heck are those? What happens is um, they modeled essentially a ray of wireless signal when it bounces off a wall and then is intercepted by the receiver as a cluster of rays because there's local scattering along the way. So what happens is it might be a pencil thin ray, but then it hits the wall, it has a little bit of dispersiveness, and then all those disper dispersive rays get intercepted by the same receiver, right? And so, and there might be a little bit of variations in amplitude, time, phase, all that jazz. So what happens is, imagine you have different rays bouncing off all these walls being picked up by the receiver, each with different distances, so they have different arrival times. We call it inter-arrival times, right? Between every cluster of rays, we have a certain set amount of times that is described by a Poisson arrival process. What random variable describes a Poisson arrival process, or sorry, random process? Exponential. So what happens is an exponential um, uh, well, in this case, actually, you could say an exponential random variable if you assume that it doesn't change over time. Uh, exponential random variable 
is chosen to dictate randomly. Like, let's say you want to change the environment a little bit, but what is the inter-arrival time between these, these two guys? Oh, OK, the exponential random variable says this. How about these two guys? This. These two guys, this. And then the scattering of that ray into multiple little rays, what is the intra-arrival time of the individual rays being reached by the receiver, right? Or intercepted by the receiver? That's also a Poisson arrival process, which is using an exponential random variable. What are some other parameters? Well, the other thing is, as we'll look at, the amplitude attenuation of the individual rays. Of rays. And what happens is the way they did it is they dictated. So what happens is each one of these guys is a Rayleigh random variable, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. And then what happens is, let's see if that works. Yeah, that works. What happens is they applied an exponential dampening function. Because they found that the, the, first, the first ray that arrives should have the shortest path and have the most energy, more or less, right? This is, again, this is their model. And that everything after that should have some sort of decay factor, which they modeled. Let me think. How did they model it? Using something called gamma. So ga big gamma. So big, there's big gamma and little gamma. Little gamma, every cluster of rays is attenuated using uh, an exponential function that has a parameter gamma, little gamma, to model that. And then for all clusters, there's an overall exponential dampening function that's dictated by big gamma. So e to the big gamma t, or whatever, right? But in, in the nutshell, their, their model kind of describes, so, so exercise for the, for the student, for all you guys, is to read Selene Valenzuela. And this guy, well, let's see. Let's do it in real time, because I feel adventurous. I don't know what that means. Sele, no, I don't think so. Yay! 1987. Yep. So that's, so here we, uh, is it that? No, 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 no. Yeah, okay, so Google Scholar. Yeah, so that's how he looks like. No, just kidding. Here we go. A statistical model for indoor multipath propagation. And so, uh, let's see, is there a PDF of this? Thank you, WPI. Yeah, and so both of these guys were with AT&T Bell Labs, which was like the mecca of all electrical engineers. So what happens is, this is, I would say, everyone should be reading this paper like for next time. And what happens is what they did in order to validate, because this is all like, you know, I wouldn't say it's intuition, but it makes sense based on what they have observed. These guys are really serious channel propagation folks. And what they did at Bell Labs is they had this set up to actually m measure what these propagation effects look like at different frequencies. And so they developed all these models. All these parameters I'm mentioning here, this is exactly what I just described, but they use beta and all that. But, but the gist of it all is essentially what I just described. And then they verified their model using um, actual measured responses afterwards to see if they do indeed match. So what I would do is, you know, and this is really not a bad read. There's like, there's no Shannon capacity that we have to worry about. There's no gross math. There's no Q functions. This stuff is really, they took a bunch of measurements. They, they say, I think this mathematical model with these random parameters would jive 
with what we're observing, and then they correlate it with an actual measurement campaign. Okay? So this paper is actually really, really nice. And if any, any of you are doing wireless propagation in indoor environments, like you two guys for your project, and maybe for your research, many of you, this would be an excellent starting point. It's, it's, it's really kind of defined uh, as, as kind of the um, standard. So this is actually what I was mentioning before. So you have an exponential dampening. See, so here is the gamma term I was telling you about. So what happens is the first cluster should always be the strongest because it is probably the shortest path. It got reflected the least. And it's probably, it, you know, it basically got there first at T naught, right? And then everything else, they said, mm, should be exponentially decaying for some reason. It's kind of related to path loss, right? Which is the relationship between the energy and distance traveled of a wireless signal, which can be modeled as an exponential, uh, uh, you know, in this case. Then every cluster is also modeled as exponentially being dampened, as we see here. And each one of these clusters, boom, boom, boom. And then you got these guys here. And you might wonder, why don't I see that kind of being represented? Why is this guy kind of higher than these guys here? Because remember what happens in your high school physics class with um, you know, the ripple tank? You had two waves, like you know, the little, little beads in the water, and you have constructive and destructive interference. What happens if you have energy of, let's say, two pulses, and they're in phase? They constructively <laughs> add together, and they make a taller peak, right? Likewise, if you have something that's, you know, plus and minus, and they're both in phase, they will cancel each other out, destructive interference. And so the same principles apply in this case over here, right? So then they go on, they talk about, you know, the model of the environment, and then here's some more measurements. You know, they talk about the rate arrival. So this is actually pretty cool, because the way, what they did is they basically broke down every one, every part of their model and describe this is what this means. This is how we observed it. This is how it's modeled. And it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty nice. And then they compared, and it goes on. My favorite part of all these journal papers is usually the bios at the end. Yep. <laughs> of course, you know, and like, yeah, yeah. Like, my, my, my photograph from many, many years ago and now, you know, don't really match, especially with this. Like, you know, I really need to update my profile picture. So, in any case, this is something that all of you should be um, looking at, um, like if you're going to do anything indoor. But going back to this, okay, yes. Are they assume, uh, the correlated? Okay, so the question is, um, are the multipaths uh, correlated in the model? The answer is um, how. In terms of the information content, absolutely. It's the same signal but it's being reflected. So like, for instance, let me draw that. So what, what essentially is happening is you have a transmitter. You have essentially a transmitter, Tx. You have a receiver, Rx. And what happens is this is an omnidirectional antenna. So this almost goes into Right? So you have near field, you have far field. And what ends up happening, I don't know what's happening. So what happens is, the way this works is you can model the radiation as waves, or you can model it as rays. So I like to look at these, this as I have energy going in this direction, this direction, this direction, this direction, this direction, uniformly. I'm using a dipole antenna. If I use a sectored array or something, I would do this for only 120 deg 20 degrees, right? Sectored or whatever, directional antenna, even narrower than that. But suppose I use an omni. And so what happens is, suppose that omni now comes in, in contact with a wall. Here's another wall. Oh, here's a, I don't know, like a pillar right in the middle of the room, which is more like my basement. Uh, <laughs> and then here's another one. Now what happens? This ray will go boom, and then it will hit. This ray over here has direct line of sight. This guy bounces off him and goes there. Let's say this freaky situation bounce, 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 
bounce, just, just for that. What is, what is kind of interesting about the physics here? Speed of light is finite. So the longer this guy transmits, or the longer the path that it takes for this guy to reach the receiver, the later it's going to be received. What's the other thing? Path loss. What's another thing? Every time I reflect against something, it absorbs some of that energy. It's not a perfect reflection, right? There's also phase rotations and all these stuff. But the information is the same, right? So this guy is transmitting. This guy is transmitting the same energy, the same signal, but it's being received at the receiver at delayed time instances at different amplitude levels, different phases, uh, sometimes in clusters. And then the receiver is like, what? How do I decode all of this? So, that, that, and so MIMO, which is, I think, what you're thinking about, if we had an array, I would want to take advantage of that dispersive environment to make sure that every path is uncorrelated as much as possible. Right? In the case of if I have a single antenna to single antenna, the information is absolutely, like, you know, it's the same information, but the paths might be uncorrelated. But then at the problem is at the receiver, all I have is just, like, I only have one receiver, so it's only one ear. Everything looks like gobbledygook. It's like, is it that signal? It's almost like if I'm talking with you, and then let's say I have several copies of my communications with you happening afterwards, you're going to be like, oh my god, I, I don't understand. Or it's really irritating, you don't want to hear me. Which is almost the case anyway, right? It's like, ah! Yeah. So what happens is, to answer your question, it's the exact same information. The paths might be uncorrelated, but the information is absolutely the same, and it's being picked up by one antenna at the receiver, so we, we can't do anything. That's later in the next lecture, where we talk about diversity. If we have diversity, we will totally exploit any lack of correlation we can in the propagation environment. Good question. So this is what I'm talking about, is we have this type of environment, lots of reflection. And what's really neat about it is when we have this environment, what, how does it look like at the receiver? Essentially, it's delayed copies of the same signal with different amplitudes, different phases, different times. How do we model this? We can model as an FIR filter, but in the passband. We, when, where do we do most of our derivations? In baseband, right? So we're going to have to find a comparable model to translate this down into the baseband. Okay? So going back to this guy here, so let's skip him. One thing I wanted to bring up, and I think, again, this is relevant to, to you two guys, is that multipath, you might say, Wiglinski's basement, this classroom, law of environments, nothing's moving, is there? There's stuff moving, right? Like, for instance, like, like the last couple of days, all that heavy wind, all that scary wind, right? Like, like especially like houses that are made of wood, like my own, you hear creaking, windows move a little bit. My dog gets scared. <gasps> What's that? Is it a deer? You know? But what happens is environments are always vibrating, right? In the case of vehicular communications, oh my god. So, you know, from the perspective of your car as you're driving, what's changing? The landscape's constantly changing. New buildings are moving by, pedestrians, cars are zipping by you all over the place. It's time varying. The reflection, reflective environment as a function of time is constantly changing. Your FIR filter is changing, right? Even indoors, like that projector and that projector over there that's projecting these slides up onto the um, screens, they're vibrating. You can even see the screen slightly vibrating. Why is that? Because there's this humongous air conditioner next room over, one floor up. And that alone, you know, it vibrates the chalkboards, right? It vibrates the glass in the windows. Concrete, the, the brick might be vibrating, but not so badly. But that wall, like, so there's a lot of things that are moving in this building, even ever so slightly, that it can create a little bit of time variation. One of the weirdest things about the room next door, so for instance, you know that drop down ceiling? So it's about 20 feet from the drop down ceiling to the actual roof 
of the building. So j just FYI, if you ever take the, the, one of the tiles and you look up there, there's like 20 feet of emptiness. It's really cool. The reason is nobody wants a ceiling that's 20 feet tall or 30 feet tall. It will look like, oh, like, you know, overall. But the problem is these projectors over there, the big problem is they're on poles that are 20 feet long. And imagine you have a vibrating source. Have you ever seen a projection in that room? It's moving ever so slightly. It's very irritating. So anyways, back, back to learning. So what happens is vibrations of the wall, street traffic, there's enough there, windy environments, movements of either transmitter or receiver, people moving, right? People shifting in their seats or, or whatnot. That can all create enough movement to make the channel time varying. So this model here, so let's start off with this guy. What's S of T? So that's my signal that I'm transmitting over the air. And it has a low pass equivalent, S of L. And so just like what we always do, what's, what's the relationship between band pass and low pass? It's take the low pass signal, exponentially modulate. So you're essentially moving it to a center frequency, FC, and you're taking the real of that. That's going to be your band pass realization. Where do the reflections happen? Band pass realization. Where do we do most of our analysis? Baseband, right? So we need some sort of way of bringing it back you know, bringing back the baseband. So x of t is the weighted sum of copies of your transmitted signal s of t. How is it weighted? First of all, how are the copies defined? It's all identical, but they each have different time delays involved. And where do the time delays come from? That's a propagation delay for the different sort of reflections in the environment. Sometimes it's within the cluster. Sometimes it could be from different clusters. And then each one's weighted by an attenuation factor, and that's time varying. So the propagation delay and the attenuation factors are time varying because, you know, destructive, constructive interference, path loss along the way, different varying path lengths. And then on top of that, um, you know, the clusters, the environment, like, you know, it's moving too. So this will influence how the copies are reaching your receiver from your transmitter. Right? So this is all great and dandy. So everyone sees where I'm getting this. So this guy is essentially, from a passband representation, so from a passband representation, what it looks like is this. So I have my S of T, I feed it into this environment, creates a multipath propagation, and out comes X of T. So what I'm doing is I'm taking S of T and I'm convolving it with this environment to create all these replicas, and they all have different amp uh, attenuation factors, right? And so what ends up happening is this X of T is just sort of a convolutional mess, if you will, of all these copies weighted differently at different time instances, all summed together, right? Now, let's bring this down to baseband. So we know that the baseband representation of X of T is going to be very messy. So we know that the passband representation of S of T would be something with some sort of complex exponential, right, to do the frequency modulation. And then we take the real of it. We would have this as x of t. And what we really want is what is the equivalent low pass version of it? What happens is we get rid of the frequency modulation. So what are we left with? We're going to be left with our attenuation. That's cool. We have the low pass equivalent time delayed. That's cool. But we picked up this little straggler along the way. What, what, what's this guy? So when we did the baseband to passband modulation, right? So anything with a T now is T plus tau C, right? That creeped in to the frequency modulation to the carrier frequency to the passband. So when we do the baseband conversion, what do we modulate down with? Just FC, right? Right? 
So what ends up happening is, if we look at this model, how do we get from S of t, right, S L of t, that's my low pass version, to my low pass version receive signal, right, forget pass band, it turns out that my channel response, if I were to convolve this guy with this guy to get that guy, is him, right? So, I, okay, so no one should be surprised that there's a delta involved, right? That's the easiest way in a signals and systems approach to create replicas of stuff that are time delayed, right? And then if it's linear, it is going to be the superposition of all these delayed elements with these weighing terms, with these complex exponentials, Ta-da! Right? So far so good? Yep. Okay. Now, this is not quite accurate. And so in Venezuela, they also use discrete rays and stuff too. The problem is, if we look at it before we look at the analog to digital conversion, we have a continuum of rays, right? Isn't, like, what's wrong with that model I drew where you have an um, omnidirectional antenna just like propagating out? What's the problem with that? It's a continuum of energy, right? Isotropic, not isotropic, omnidirectional is 360 degrees of energy in all directions of the same signal going out instantly. The problem with this model is I'm assuming that we have discrete rays being intercepted at the receiver. That, that, that's a good model, but it's not accurate. What we're in fact picking up is a continuum of rays, right? A continuum of signals. So, but not all is lost. All we need to do is convert that sum of n into an integral. So what we want to do is we want to integrate we, let's assume we do have a continuum of rays, and we have a continuum of weighing factors, and we have a continuum of deltas and such. Let's, let's change this around a little bit. Let's, let's, in, let's make this an integral. And the way you do that is as such. Essentially, we can model x of t. And remember, we're, we're going back to the passband. What we can do is we can essentially say, let's take our signal. Okay, S of t. First of all, we have, we're going to integrate across all delays. So, all possible delays, all possible attenuated values of all those delayed values across all time, right? And that will be our X of t, right? This guy, what does he look like? Continuous time convolution, right? Right? Does everyone see that? So what ends up happening is we now bring it down to baseband, just like the trick before. Now we really have a convolution, and we have that pesky complex exponential. So the continuous time, low pass time variant impulse response, CT tau, is going to be equal to this guy. All right? So, so in a nutshell, what we've done is we've gone from the simple, here are all these rays, discrete rays, and now they're being received by this receiver, to here's a continuum of the same energy, the uh, same signal across all time being intercepted by my antenna, right? So, you know, just like, you know, let's say if I've been talking with Bengi, and then we have, like, you know, multipath propagation, it's not like Bengi will hear multiple discrete copies of my voice. She'll hear a continuum of them. Just like if you go to the Grand Canyon and say, echo, it's going to be like, you know, reverberation. It'll be so cool. Say my name. Alex, Alex. Okay. So, where is this useful? You know, I've I'm, I'm not been talking for the last 20 minutes, and it's like, okay, let's move on to the next topic. Let's, let's delve into this a little bit more. One book that does wonders for this topic is Ted Rappaport's book. The wireless communications book, phenomenal. You know, that's how he learned wireless communications. Because he, Ted Rappaport, there's also a guy, Georgia Tech, by name of Gregory Durgin. These are real wireless propagation model type folks. Professor Polyvon, that's another guy. Wireless propagation channel modeling person. And so, 
what are the types of fading that you can get from this? So some of you might be aware of these. So the first one is Rayleigh fading. So Rayleigh fading assumes that, you know, uh, essentially your, that CT tau business, that, that, uh, that essentially your um, channel impulse response, if you will, is a zero mean complex Gaussian random process, right? We saw this before. What happens when you have a complex Gaussian and you try and find what is its magnitude response and its phase response? It's going to be Rayleigh and uniform, respectively, right? And, and that's, in this case, we have something that is Rayleigh. And that comes up when we don't have a line of sight component, right? It's essentially a dispersive environment where no one path is direct line of sight. That's how we get that. Ricean, what happens is we do have a, a single path uh, from transmitter receiver. And, what, and how do we get that? We have a Gaussian, a ga complex Gaussian, but it does not have zero mean. There's one dominant, the, basically the bias of your random variable is non-zero. And that's due to a, a visual line of sight path. And therefore, what happens is if you find the magnitude of your complex Gaussian in this case, and this is also, if you take any probability course, take a complex Gaussian, find the magnitude response of it, it will give you a Ricean distribution, right? The, the thing that, uh, you know, sounds really cool and you should check out in, in Proacus and Salehi, you know, Digital Communications 5th edition, in section 13.1-2, is Nakagami M. This, you know, I know a few colleagues of mine who do a lot of research with this type of fading channel, and it's a superset. It totally cat it classifies, it characterizes Ricean and Rayleigh fading as like unique cases of Nakagami M, like M equals zero is Ray Ray Rayleigh or something like that. Okay? But before we jump into these unique types of fading, let's, let's talk a little bit about um, how do we characterize how do we characterize these types of channels? Okay, multipath fading channels. So, in a nutshell, there are, there's a couple of ways. I'm going to talk about the two big ones. And here's my pen. Okay. So what happens is. Um, Whenever we look at, let's say, let's say we take an indoor environment. Okay, let's say that's a table or a pillar or something. Here's another pillar. Okay, and then let's say that's your transmit antenna. That's your receive antenna, right? And then let's say we have signals that do that, do that, do that. All that multipath, right? So, so the, there are two, two, um, there are two, two things that I'm really, really kind of interested in. Okay. So the first one is is the delay spread. So what happens is, so delay spread, okay, so what happens is this means, how, like where does the bulk of my signal, the, all the reflections, the duration, right, like where does the bulk of those reflections occur and how many t tau seconds, right? Um, there is a statistical character characteristic, which is called coherence time, right? So what does that mean? And so coherence time, as, as the name implies, has something to do with um, the property of your channel in terms of, like, let's say you take two seconds, right? And so this actually ties into what Bengi asked a little bit earlier about the correlation between, let's say, different paths, or in this case, um, let's say over time, let's say we look at all the events just from the perspective of one receive antenna, right? W what we want is, let's say, how correlated 
are two points in time in my transmission, right? And I, and I separate them by t seconds. What does that mean? So what that means is, let's say if I have a very long, echoey-like channel, and even after t seconds, I am getting copies of my originally transmitted signal here, and I want to start transmitting here. Coherence time is pretty high, right? So if I'm, because basically, my, my reflections do not die down that quickly. So a very high coher coherence time means that I'm still getting replicas of a signal I transmitted over here appearing over here. Something with a very short coherence time means that the dispersiveness is very quick. And if, let's say, my next symbol is totally uncorrelated to the next guy, wonderful. I have not, I wouldn't want to say ISI, but I don't have the previous transmission contained in my current one, even if it's a copy. Right? So coherence time is kind of related to the delay spread. Okay? So from this, you have something called coherence time. What's the other guy? Well, there's something called coherence bandwidth. That's an H. And what does that mean? So let's say we take the, d the delay profile or whatever the sort of channel response that we have and we translate into the frequency domain, right? What I'm kind of interested in knowing is at one frequency in my transmission, how does, it, how does the attenuation of that guy change as a function of frequency? So let's say I start at DC and then I progressively go out to the edge of the band, right? Like the coherence bandwidth essentially is like, how, how does the properties of the attenuation of the channel or the gain or whatever, basically the properties of the channel change as a function of frequency, right? So coherence time talks about how that information sort of dies away, how quickly or how slowly. And coherence bandwidth is what about the properties of the channel itself, how it attenuates across frequency. Does it change rapidly or does it not change much at all? So for instance, like, like, let's say something with a very wide coherence bandwidth means that over a very long period of time, does my channel actually begin to change its characteristics, right? And a very narrow coherence bandwidth means that, what does that mean? Means that the properties of the channel in the frequency domain actually vary rapidly across frequency, right? So these are two terms, coherence bandwidth and coherence time, and, the, and the, the, the latter, the coherence time is tied to the delay spread, right? So if we go back to the notes, so I needed to articulate this in this way because this, this is a smattering of like words and words and words and words, but the, the, I'm sort of giving you sort of the punchlines, okay? So again, um, when we look at the channel correlation functions, we want, these are random guys, right? We're talking about Rayleigh random variables, Reitzian random variables. We're talking about complex Gaussians being combined in various ways and such. So what happens is we want to statistically characterize because they are time varying and they are, they are random. We don't know what exactly it looks like in this environment until we deal with them. What these guys mean, uh, how do we characterize these guys? So here's that multi-path delay profile that I was talking about, okay? So first of all, what is the autocorrelation function of, let's say we have our channel impulse response, right? And so we have tau, right? And we have t. And so what happens is in order to correlate this guy, let's correlate versus t. So our correlation function, our autocorrelation function of this guy is essentially we have RC, right? Tau 1, tau 2, and then delta T. And the expression is we take the expectation of C complex conjugate tau 1 T and C tau 2 T plus delta T. So that's where we're offsetting 
these two guys. Okay? And so what happens is the attenuation and phase shift of the channel associated with the, the path delay is uncorrelated, and the attenuation phase shift associated with the path delay. So, so we, we have something called uncorrelated scattering, right? So this can be represented, right, because of this uncorrelated scattering. We can kind of remove tau 2 out of the equation to keep things simple. Otherwise, it's kind of like we have three variables for our autocorrelation function. Very, very complex. So what we want to do is we have, let's say, here's our tau term. And, tau, you know, we have it non, it's a uncorrelated scattering situation, right? So all the scattering paths, like what Bengi asked earlier, so good question, because it keeps on coming back. What happens is uh, all those paths are uncorrelated, right? The tau 1, tau 2. So, so basically we say, okay, it's uncorrelated. That means when tau 1 equals tau 2, boom, we have a non relation scheme. Otherwise, it's uncorrelated, right? And then now we're looking at the delta t. So when we do that, we, we first of all have something called the multipath spread. That's the delay spread that I was telling you guys about. And notice how it has this like exponentially dying profile. It could have any sort of profile, but essentially what we expect to see is that as sort of the straggler reflections begin to get a, begin to get intercepted by the receiver, they should be very low energy because they took forever to get there. Lucky them. And then that's it. It dies off after a while. It should, anyway. So what ends up happening is if you do the mathematics, okay, so in the frequency domain, you know, you can do the Fourier transform, you get almost the same thing, except that now you have F2, F1. And so, lo and behold, it looks like a Fourier transform of what I just described before, except now we actually, um, you know, just, just instead of using tau 1s and tau 2s, you have F1s and F2s, and then that translates using that conversion into, essentially, it's a Fourier transform. And what you get, okay, if you take the Fourier transform of this guy, is some, this guy, if you take the Fourier transform of the function, right, with the delay spread, what do you get? You get the intensity profile. It's basically across all these frequency values, these delta F values, what happens is what you're getting, essentially. So as, like, you know, you, like, what is the difference between this frequency value and that frequency value? What happens is you get something called the multipath intensity profile. It's essentially the PSD, if you will, of, so it makes sense, right? If you take the Fourier transform of your autocorrelation function, what do you get? Power spectral density. Now, I'm taking the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation of my multipath delay profile. What do I get? Multipath intensity profile. Correct? So, looking at that, again, if you have uncorrelated scattering, this will actually translate down into the frequency domain. And so, what we get, that RC delta F delta T, we call it the space frequency, space time, correlation function of the channel. And what's really interesting is if you take sort of the magnitude of that guy, and, and of course you have the time domain, um, you have this guy here, this delta F, okay, uh, which is approximately equal to 1 over Tm, this guy here, your delay spread. So 1 over Tm, this guy gives you coherence bandwidth, right? So coherence bandwidth, remember what it is. It's the, it's how similar the properties are in the frequency domain between, um, uh, you know, across frequency of your channel. Like, you know, the, uh, and, and so this 1 over Tm business, it's, it's approximate, it's loosely related, um, tells you how similar those properties are. If it's, a, if it's um, the coherence bandwidth is very small, means that your channel properties are changing very rapidly, and vice versa. And what's interesting to note is that if your coherence bandwidth, so if you have this guy, and if this value is small in comparison to the bandwidth of your transmitted signal, 
it's said to be frequency selective. Okay, so you might wonder, where did he get this term frequency selective? Time to illustrate. I think we need new batteries for this thing. <laughs> okay, so what that means is, so over frequency, so what happens if, let's say, your, your, the frequency response of your channel profile looks like this? It's quite nice, huh? It's, not, it's flat. So that means my transmission over here has the same amount of attenuation as my transmission over here, and over here, and over here. Frequency selective, on the other hand, Let's say something like that. I know, I'm a bad artist. But notice that the selectivity, like, you know, the amount of attenuation experienced at this point is different than here, here, here. Correct? And so this is kind of related to the idea of the coherence bandwidth. It's like, you know, so whenever I talk about, oh, the coherence bandwidth is very big, it's very wide, which means that I'm pretty confident that at this frequency and that frequency, the channel is impacting it approximately the same. And if it co coherence bandwidth is very narrow, means that all bits are off in the frequency just a little bit away from that. Okay? All right. My crude diagram of frequency selective fading. <laughs> okay. So, and then, yeah, it's frequency non-selective is the other term. And so there's now, like, you know, all this other sort of mathematics that sort of describe the time variations of the channel uh, measured in terms of delta t. So you have a lambda term. And what's interesting about the lambda term is, is the following. So let's say we, we replace the delta t with that guy instead, okay? And also in here in this expression. And now we, let's say, the delta f, let's say there's no difference in frequency. We're looking at the same frequency, okay? We set it to zero. So what we have now is the power spectral density of the channel profile. We, we're, not, we're looking at the exact same frequency. Now let's change lambda, which is sort of a time parameter. And this gives you another very interesting property. Remember, we're now looking at, so what does lambda represent? Some sort of time variable, right? So we replace the time variable with lambda. This actually gives you something quite interesting. So when you, when you change out for lambda, so it's power spectral density, we're not looking at different frequencies, so it's the same. So this gives you the signal in intensity as a function of what we call this lambda is called the Doppler frequency, right? And so the Doppler frequency, um, essentially if we change this lambda over various values and such, um, we call it, uh, another term for it is called the Doppler spread. And so, and it's also related to the, that coherence time business that I was talking about. So does anyone know what Doppler spread is? Hopefully, maybe. Motion of a very, yeah, you guys should, right? So what happens is, whenever we talk about Doppler, physical phenomenon when you have an object in motion and now you're, um, there's a little cause of that motion, whether it's towards you or away from you, right? So that creates a little bit of a sticky situation with respect to carrier frequencies. And then, of course, what happens is, we have the scattering function of the channel, and this tells you how much average power output from the channel is a function of the delay spread and the Doppler frequency lambda. So again, so I've kind of bombarded all of you guys with a lot of terms, but what's sort of the punchline? So if, let's say, not, without taking a full-blown wireless channel modeling course, what should you guys pick up from this? That there is things like Rayleigh fading, Rising fading, you should hear about Nakagami M. Again, if you want to fall asleep, read about Nakagami M tonight. Um, that there are different ways of characterizing this information in terms of delay spread, coherence bandwidth, coherence time, Doppler spread. That's all you really, you know, enough to be dangerous with in terms of modeling the environment and how multipath propagation happens in it. All right? So, and again, 
And just to reiterate, read section 13.1-2 in your textbook because that will give you a little bit of insights on Nakagami M fading. Okay? So with that, uh, that concludes lecture 35. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to just jump into lecture 36. 12 slides and 30